My name is Jim Lakeley. I am the Communications Director of the Heartland Institute. We're a uh, free market think tank based in Chicago, Illinois in the United States. And we're an organization that has been called the world's most influential think tank, pushing back on the hypothesis of catastrophic human-caused climate change. And as part of Heartland's of meeting that mission is what brings us to Rome this week. The Pope, as everyone in this room knows, has invited the United Nations to advise him on the latest science of climate change. We're here to prevent the Pope from making a mistake because he won't be getting the whole picture. For instance, the United Nations IPCC's mandate is not to determine if humans are adversely affecting the climate. Its mandate is to determine to what extent human activity is adversely affecting the climate. In other words, to assume there is a problem but there is not a problem. From the start in 1990, the IPC's predictions on the climate have been wildly inaccurate. A combination of the abandonment of the scientific method, stacking the deck in favor of climate alarmism, and frankly, outright corruption. The Pope would be making a great mistake if he puts his moral authority behind a United Nations that is not credible on the science and advocates policies, especially in the energy sector, that would keep the poor of the world in even, even greater poverty for longer. The esteemed independent scientists and policy experts that the Heartland Institute has brought to Rome this week are here to make some of these arguments to serve as a necessary balance to the, uh, to the Pope's summit. I will introduce each one, and then uh, they will make some brief remarks, and then we'll open it up to the floor for further questions from anyone. Uh, we'll start off then with E. Calvin Beisner. He is the founder of the Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation. Thank you, Jim. Having read some 50 books on the science and over 30 on the economics of climate change and climate policy, plus thousands of articles, including hundreds of peer-reviewed ones, I could talk on those topics. I could point out that computer climate models, on average, simulate twice as much warming as observed over a relevant period, and none simulated the complete absence of warming over the past 18 plus years. That means the models are wrong, and therefore they provide no rational basis to fear man-made warming, and therefore they provide no rational basis for any climate policy. But others here are fully qualified to discuss that, so I won't. I'm here to discuss the ethics of climate policy. When I was a small child, my father, working then for the United States State Department, was posted to Calcutta, India. There, my mother contracted a virus that paralyzed her for about six months, leaving her unable to care for her four children. My two oldest sisters were students at Loretto House, the school run by the nun who would become Mother Teresa, and one of them, in fact, went back to work alongside Mother Teresa some 20 years later. My other sister and I were too young to do for school, so we were sent to spend each day with different Indian families. Early each morning, my ayah, or nurse, would walk me several blocks to the home where I stayed. And that experience left me with an indelible picture, indeed with many, many indelible picture memories of the dead bodies of those who had died of hunger and disease overnight over and around whose bodies we stepped. Those picture memory, memories are the root of my passion to see the world's poor rise out of poverty. And that's why I'm here. That's why I'm willing to pour myself into the battle against global warming alarmism. The policies meant to mitigate global warming all involved, though they do not explicitly say so, slowing the rise out of poverty for the world's poor. Why? Well, because all involved depriving them of access to abundant, affordable, reliable energy derived from fossil fuels. 
No society has ever risen out of poverty without that, and for the foreseeable future, none will. Because energy plays a crucial role in making and moving everything. Food, clothing, shelter, transportation, medical care, communications, everything. And fossil fuels are the most abundant, affordable, and reliable source of that energy. There is no empirical evidence the only, thing, the only kind of evidence that counts in science, that our use of fossil fuels is driving dangerous warming. But there is overwhelming evidence that our use of them is crucial to lifting the world's remaining four billion or so poor out of poverty and the miseries that accompany it, including disease and premature death. There's also overwhelming evidence that our use of fossil fuels enhances plant life around the world by adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. On average, for every doubling of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere, you get a 35% increase in plant growth efficiency. Plants grow better in warmer and cooler temperatures and in wetter and drier soils and make better use of soil nutrients, consequently expanding their ranges, greening the planet, and shrinking deserts. They resist diseases and pests, but they improve fruitage. And that's a win-win-win situation because pretty much all life on Earth is plants or something that eats plants or something that eats something that eats plants. Rising CO2 therefore makes food more available for the world's poor, the very thing Pope Francis should want. It also reflects more access to more energy, alleviating poverty. Again, the very thing Pope Francis no doubt wants. The Bible. The Word of God requires rulers to protect the poor from oppression. Psalm 72 or 73, depending on which rendering you use, teaches that the godly prince protects the poor because they cannot protect themselves. When after his conversion, Paul the Apostle visited the other apostles in Jerusalem, the only thing they asked of him was that he remember the poor, which he said in Galatians 2.10 was, quote, the very thing I was eager to do. Quote. The policies meant to mitigate global warming would oppress the poor by depriving them of the energy without which they cannot rise out of poverty. If we are to remember the poor and protect them from oppression, we must oppose such policies. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it in 2459, 2460, and 2463, man, not the earth mind you, but man is himself the author, the center, and goal of all economic and social life. The decisive point of the social question is that good created by God for everyone, good including, I would add, abundant, affordable, reliable energy stored in fossil fuels ready to be released and harnessed by man to meet human needs, Good created by God for everyone should in fact reach everyone in accordance with justice and with the help of charity. True development concerns the whole man. It is concerned with increasing each person's ability to respond to his vocation and hence to God's call. How can we not recognize Lazarus, the Catechism goes on, the hungry beggar in the parable of Luke 17? in the multitude of human beings without bread, a roof, or a place to stay. How can we fail to hear Jesus, as you did it not to the least of these, you did it not to me. So I urge Pope Francis to protect the poor by rejecting calls to deprive the world's poor of the abundant, affordable, reliable energy available from fossil fuels. The Cornwall Alliance for the Stewardship of Creation, which I lead, issued a declaration last year saying that, uh, saying exactly that, copies of which are available here today. We also just issued an open letter to Pope Francis on climate change, signed by many outstanding scientists, economists, policy experts, theologians, pastors, and ethicists, making the same point. That too is available here today and on our website, cornwallalliance.org. Thank you.
Thank you, Cal. Um, next up to speak is Elizabeth Yor. She's an attorney and international child rights advocate uh, based as the Hart Institute is out of Chicago. Thank you for coming today. I'm the only uh, non-scientist speaking today. The Heartland Institute sought my consultation as an attorney who has worked on international human trafficking cases and in the field of child exploitation for 30 years, most recently with Oprah Winfrey in South Africa. I am here because I am deeply troubled by the statement issued by the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences regarding the upcoming papal conference tomorrow. And I quote that the goal of the Pontifical Academy Conference is, the desired outcome is a joint statement on the moral and religious imperative of sustainable development, highlighting the intrinsic connection between respect for the environment and respect for people, especially the poor, the excluded, victims of human trafficking and modern slavery, unquote. This declaration of an intrinsic connection, a nexus between climate change and human trafficking is on its face preposterous, deceptive, and infinitely damaging to the plight of victims of human trafficking around the world. This fallacious statement links a real human crisis of modern slavery with a manufactured one of climate change. St. John Paul the Great powerfully articulated the nature of modern slavery in 2002 when he stated, the sexual exploitation of women and children must be recognized as an intrinsic violation of human dignity and rights and to reduce the rich mystery of human sexuality to a mere commodity." Unquote. Based on my extensive experience with human trafficking victims, St. John Paul II uniquely understood that the cause of this crime is the violation of the dignity of the human person. Human trafficking thrives in both developed and undeveloped countries. Its victims and perpetrators span the economic spectrum. This crime is growing for a multitude of reasons. Open borders, the ease of jet travel and transportation, the instantaneous internet connection to conduct this criminal enterprise, and yes, abortion and its heinous and predictable mutation, sex selection abortion. Nature abhors a vacuum, and with the void of 140 million missing Asian girls as a result of genocide. Abortion, not climate change, is fueling the human trafficking trade. But at the core of human trafficking and modern slavery lies a malevolent heart which seeks to exploit and abuse another human being as a disposable commodity. And who? Who is the Vatican consulting with on this problem? Jeffrey Sachs, who spends his career sounding out the alarm that the world is overpopulated and fertility rates must be lowered. In fact, Sachs claims that, quote, we are bursting at the seams, unquote. The focus of Sachs' overpopulation mantra is primarily the continent of Africa. He argues that if only poor African communities and countries would just lower the fertility rate, the world and Africa would thrive economically. This fear mongering is nothing new. Sachs is standing on the shoulders of Paul Ehrlich, the architect of The Sky is Falling Deception, perpetrated in his 1968 book, The Population Bomb. Ehrlich mastered the alarmist overpopulation canard with his infamous thesis, quote, the battle to feed all of humanity is over. 
In the 1970s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death. Nothing can prevent a substantial increase in the world death rate, unquote. And in furtherance of his imagined crisis, Ehrlich supported all kinds of draconian solutions to address this concocted calamity, including putting birth control in the water supply, forced abortions, coercive sterilizations, forcibly punishing countries who balk at implementing radical population control measures. Ehrlich's doomsday proposal and prophecy was a fraud. Nevertheless, as a consequence of Ehrlich's population deceit, the UN began its course of a worldwide reproductive pressure to reduce population, including using, including sterilization, contraception, and abortion. The big lie, Ehrlich's big lie, worked, and the UN used fear as an opportunity to introduce abortion into the world order. Jeffrey Sachs continues the Paul Ehrlich phony drumbeat of overpopulation and conveniently adds a new fear tactic of climate change and human trafficking to justify and bolster the urgency and other sterilization tools to achieve the UN's sustainable development goals. Today, same tactics, same players, new alarm bells. The scare tactic and strategy of overpopulation debunked by reality. Catastrophic global warming debunked by science. Morphs into climate change debunked by science. Morphs into sustainable development. Undeterred, the United Nations exerts its power to impose elitist goals on the world under the phony rubric of shared sustainable development goals, yet forever embedded into the bureaucratic culture of the UN is their de desired weapon of choice, abortion on demand. And that is why it is so very troubling that a papal conference entitled Dignified Humanity that the, the Vatican is consulting with the Secretary General of the UN and Jeffrey Sachs to recommend sustainable development measures, which we all know include abortion, contraception, and sterilization to reduce alleged climate change. And as the Catechism points out, quote, from the moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person among which is the inviolable right of every human being to have life. Over the centuries, the Catholic moral teaching uniquely understood the power of laws to deprive certain human beings of the right to life. And these are the precious and profound tenets of the Catholic Church regarding the sacredness of life and human, human dignity. So it's perplexing that abortion and reproductive rights zealots like UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and Jeffrey Sachs, the director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions, are prominently highlighted at this Catholic conference in anticipation of the Pope's environmental encyclical. As a Roman Catholic and a child's right advocate, I am deeply troubled by the recommendations and policies promulgated by Jeff Sachs in his various roles at the UN, his rabid advocacy of abortion and reproductive health services are in direct contravention of the moral teaching of the Catholic Church. In fact, the very success of Sustainable Development Goals, the UN Global Initiative, depends, according to Sachs, on reducing the high fertility rate of the third world. In Jeffrey Sachs' brand new book, published January 2015, he states, we must reduce the population. More abortions, fewer people. Sachs continues to underscore the need for low fertility rates as the barometer of successful sustainable development goals. 
listen to the scare tactics employed by Sachs with Africa in his sights. Quote, I'm really scared about population explosion in Nigeria. It's not healthy. Nigeria should work towards attaining a maximum of three children per family, end quote. Here is one man, Jeffrey Sachs, with the enormous power and influence of the UN, lecturing the Nigerian people to limit the size of their families to three children. The hubris is breathtaking. In conclusion, I find it incomprehensible that the Vatican would be misled into thinking that the United Nations and its Millennium and Sustainable Goals Czar share common solutions for the world's population. The Catholic Church welcomes children as a gift from God. The UN Secretary General and Jeffrey Sachs want to limit children. We seek the truth today and turn to the child, both unborn and born, rich and poor, whether African, Asian, European, or from the Americas, for the child is the guardian of the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, next, our next speaker is uh, Mark Morano. He's publisher of Climate Depot and a former senior advisor to Senator Jim Inhofe, who uh, was chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. Uh, we're here in Rome today, right outside of Vatican City, to make an appeal to the Pope in the Vatican. And here's the gist of this. We're not here, and no one's really concerned with the Pope or Vatican think about climate science, ultimately. And the Pope can have a view in line with uh, you know, Ban Ki-moon or Regina Pachari or any other global warming, uh, man-made global warming fear promoter. That's not really the concern or even the concern of Catholics around the world. The difference, and what this Pope, Pope, ben, um, uh, Pope Francis has done, he has gone an extra step that other Popes have not, or is appearing to about to take an extra step. And that step is, he is endorsing a specific UN climate treaty provision. So this changes, this is a game changer from previous popes and previous Vatican statements. The, the pope is gonna be essentially replacing Leonardo DiCaprio at this year's New York Climate Summit in New York City to speak on behalf of the UN to lobby for a treaty. So we go from Leonardo DiCaprio in 2014 to Pope Francis in 2015. This is a major concern and will sow confusion among Catholics in America and around the world. Uh, we've already got a phenomenon that many Catholics recognize, the a la carte Catholics, where sort of Catholics pick and choose which doctrine they want to follow. And the danger here, with the Pope coming out with such strong comments on global warming and endorsing a UN treaty, are very simple. The Vatican is essentially going to confuse Catholics into thinking that your position on man-made global warming fears is now an article of faith, is now part of Catholic doctrine. And that is a, is a very serious mistake. As the previous speaker, Elizabeth just went through all the details of uh, the unholy alliance, I would call it, between the agenda of the global warming fear promoters, everything from overpopulation to, to, to talking about sterilization agents in the water, as you mentioned, to uh, abortion, to family planning, and, and of course, the development restrictions. What Pope Francis and the Vatican need to realize, and hopefully we're getting that message across, is one of the greatest friends of poor people across the world, over a billion, 1.3 billion and higher, don't have running water, don't have electricity, are carbon-based energy, fossil fuels. And the idea that we can somehow leapfrog to a UN climate treaty, which is then going to allow massive redistribution of wealth, we need to understand the UN IPCC, which is going to be well represented here at this conference uh, tomorrow, has actually had an official, Edenhofer, come out and say the IPCC redistributes wealth by policy. It's not about the science. The EU Climate Commissioner has come out, Connie Hedegaard, and said even if we're wrong on the science, we're doing right by policy. They don't even try to sell the science to endorse the policy. They just say, hey, it doesn't really matter what the science says on global warming. We need these policies. So instead of arguing for centralized energy planning 
on the merits, they're using climate fair to promote it, and then at the same time they admit that they don't even need uh, the science to support their policies because this is what they should be, they want to do anyway, central planning of energy economy. The Pope, the Pope's recent comments and his willingness to get involved in the UN treaty process are the key issues of why we're here. But I would argue, and I think the skeptics here would argue, that the Vatican and the Pope should be arguing that fossil fuels are the moral choice for the developing world, where people don't have running water and electricity. And what's also concerning, and I know we spent a lot of time talking about Jeffrey Sachs, but the people that have advised the Vatican Pontifical Academy of Sciences are beyond that. Naomi Oreskes was one of the key advisors. Naomi Oreskes has proposed, has suggested that RICO statutes, prosecuting skeptics under racketeering charges, uh, is a valid way to go in the United States because uh, they want to shut down debate. Our arguments are this, the Pope can believe or not believe what he wants on global warming science and listen to who he wants to, but he shouldn't only listen to one side, people that include Naomi Oreskes, people that include Professor Peter Wadhams, who NASA's lead global warming scientist, uh, Gavin Schmidt, has said has, that Peter Wadhams, who's advising the Vatican on global warming, has used charts that, uh, that, that, that ignore basic physics. The global warming establishment is embarrassed by the choices that uh, Pope Francis and the Vatican are choosing to use as their sole source of global warming science. Uh, the other, the other uh, advisor was uh, Hans Schuldenhuber, the Brit uh, German climate advisor. He's proposed a CO2 budget for every man, woman, and child on the planet, fund essentially operated by an international organization. And guess what? Everyone in the developing world has already exceeded our CO2 budget. This, these are the kind of, this is the kind of advice that Pope Francis and the Vatican are getting, and they're allowing no dissent. So here's the key. 2007, Pope Benedict, our Pope Emeritus, for lack of a better word, warned about the prophets of doom of man-made global warming fears. And he actually said, uh, he actually said the people of wisdom, the Pope, the, the Vatican should be listening to people of wisdom uninhibited by ideology and, and not draw hasty conclusions. Well, if you're listening to Naomi Oreskes, Peter Wadhams, and you're listening to uh, Jeffrey Sachs, you're drawing hasty conclusions. By the way, Jeffrey Sachs also said that skeptics have blood on their hands every time a storm goes across the world and death tolls mount from extreme weather. Now, first of all, weather is not more extreme, and there's actual hard science with peer-reviewed studies to back that up. People like Professor Roger Pilkey Jr. have been testifying in Congress about that. But to argue that every storm that happens is now blood on the hand of every skeptic, that's frightening that the Vatican is listening to people like Jeffrey Sachs on that. I want to leave you with one word, uh, for, uh, one comment on Pope John Paul II. He never got involved in this kind of process. He grew up in Poland. He saw what centralized planning did both to economics and to human liberty and freedom and development. And, and uh, obviously it's a difference in the worldview. I think, I think a lot of uh, what the UN is proposing, the redistribution of wealth and all that, is very favorable to Pope Francis' ideology. But the man who heads the Vatican Bank, Cardinal George Pell, who was the Archbishop of Sydney, I'm going to end on his quote. He said in 2006, this is Cardinal uh, George Pell, quote, in the past, pagans sacrificed animals and even humans in vain attempts to placate uh, uh, the cruel gods. Today, they demand a reduction in CO2 emissions. I would argue that today's human sacrifices that the Cardinal Pell referred to in 2006 are the developing world. If we go forward and restrict carbon-based energy, they are going to be our modern-day human sacrifices as they are prevented, delayed, and not getting the full benefit of carbon-based energy. You can't allow the United Nations to essentially manage the developing world's development. They can manage it quite well on their own by using natural resources and carbon-based energy. So with that, we urge an appeal to Pope uh, Francis and the Vatican, do not confuse Catholics, do not listen to only one side, and do not make your posi our positions on global warming an article of faith. Thank you. Be a good Catholic. <laughs> <laughs>
basically start the program on a little bit more of a scientific note. Tom Sheehan. It's nice to be a physicist and be able to talk to you about the real science that underlies things. I look at the basic equations of physics way down to quarks and string theory, and I say, isn't it amazing that our almighty God could have been so smart as to design this extremely simple universe, and out of it comes a creature that is capable of loving him in return. That's pretty core Catholic doctrine, but it's a remarkable piece of science, too. Now, the way science works in the old days, in antiquity, was just a curiosity. Funny things happen. And nobody had an explanation for it. And then along about the late Middle Ages, they started to put some structure together and put some thought to it and make sense of the whole thing. And that was based on the fundamental issue that had been put forth by the Christian Church all those years, that our universe, our world, was intelligible and subject to reason, and that we could find out things about it. And that's where science came from. And as science grew and progressed, it became a, a matter of data having uh, supremacy. Data was what mattered. Experiments, observations, and so forth. Theory is mankind's attempt, with reason, to make some sense out of the data. But the arbiter of science, the criteria, that's data. And to this very day, that still holds as a cornerstone of science. That whatever theory you may have, however smart you are, whatever your name is, wherever you come from, you can have all kinds of theories, but if it doesn't agree with the data, it's wrong. Now, on the slide over here, we have real data. The jiggly stuff is the temperature over the last um, 16, 18 years or so. It wiggles only in the sense that that's a very delicate scale. It's less than one degree C from bottom to top. So the temperature has been wiggling within a single degree C all that time. On the other hand, the faint gray line which goes from lower left to upper right, that's carbon dioxide. And it's been going up steadily and steadily and steadily. Since the, end of the, uh, since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide has gone from about 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million today. And yet, these obviously have nothing to do with each other. These are completely independent data sets. Now, the theorists, who make global models that run on big computing machines, supercomputers, and all that, and so profound and so expensive, by the way, have built into them the idea that carbon dioxide is going to cause the temperature to rise. And as a result, the models predicting temperature are indeed going up a lot, rather than like the way CO2 is going up on this chart. But the data isn't going anywhere. The data is what we always come back to as scientists. We must stick with the data. And what the data shows is that there is no increase in temperature caused by carbon dioxide. The computer models just simply aren't correct. They need refinement. They need a whole lot more work. Notice that if there is no particular thing wrong with carbon dioxide, then there's no reason to ban fossil fuels. The case that underlies the entire UN agenda collapses unless carbon dioxide is at fault. But as the data shows, carbon dioxide is innocent of charging. And that is a very key point about science that is impossible for anybody, however profound their agenda or whatever they think of the UN may be, impossible to duck away from. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Our next uh, speaker is uh, Hal Doran. He is the retired Vice President of Engineering at Indyne Incorporated. And as a young physicist, he was part of the team uh, from NASA that helped put man on the moon. Hal.
Thank you, Jim, and thank you all for being here. I, uh, I'm here representing a group of NASA uh, Houston retirees who have been looking into the concern about global warming from fossil fuels. Uh, this is an all-volunteer effort, um, unfunded, uh, and we decided that we need to get to the truth of this matter because it involves a lot of the uh, scientific understanding that we had when we uh, sent people to the moon and back in the 1960s and 70s. Um, I'm here to report to you today, Houston, we do not have a problem. <laughs> we, looked, we looked at this threat just as we would any threat to astronauts in space, use the same methods of uh, analysis and data analysis, and we concluded that there may be a slight bit of truth to warning of the planet by fossil fuels, but it's just impossible that they could cause any problems, especially when you look at the benefits of putting more CO2 in the atmosphere and the benefits to plant life. I'm here representing my team of more than 20 retired NASA pollen program veterans, but I'm also here representing my friends from my Catholic parish who know me well and know that I'm a reputable scientist. Um, I'm concerned about the decision that Pope Francis might make, and I want him to know that you have people in your flock, many Catholics in our research team, who have looked at this thoroughly for at least three years, and we as a group are convinced that we don't have a problem with fossil fuels, that we need to have some global control of CO2 emissions. There is no problem. There might be a potential concern. The other thing that we've noticed is that we agree with the United Nations on the lower end of the sensitivity of climate uh, to fossil fuels, which doesn't represent a problem. We disagree with the higher end of their uncertainty range, which comes from climate simulation models. We have a policy at NASA. You don't use a model for a serious decision, one that affects human safety, if that model has not been validated, which means it's got to agree with physical data. And like Tom said, these models have come close to agreeing with what's happened in the climate over the last 50 to even 16 years. In mission control, we have a back room where the engineers that design the spacecraft would come to work a problem that we had in space. And it, had, it was a problem that had to be worked in a big hurry. Make a decision, how do, we, how do we resolve this threat to the crew that we have orbiting the Earth or on the moon? And the banner over that room, the big banner said, in God we trust, all others bring data. So we NASA guys are focused on the data, and that's the way we look at this problem. We derived a simple model. We used available data to plug into the model to understand what CO2 could do to the climate. And we've concluded we're going to burn up all the fossil fuels on this planet before we raise the temperature of the planet enough to, to be a concern. And I hope you would come back tomorrow and I'll give you a, a technical briefing on how we approach this problem and what our conclusions are. Thank you. Thank you, Hal. Next up of the two remaining speakers is uh, Dr. Richard Keene. He's a meteorology, meteorology instructor at the University of Colorado and uh, also an academic scientist on the Juneau Alaska Ice Field Research Program. Richard Keene. Hey, good day. <clears throat> okay, Hal so eloquently said, in God we trust all others bring data, so I'm here to bring data. Um, and my goal is, okay, the, uh, it's been said that it doesn't matter 
what the Pope or the Church thinks about climate change and global warming, how much is going on. But I would actually beg to differ because it does matter because if the Church thinks there is a problem present in terms of climate change or global warming, then they're presented with a moral dilemma of choosing between the destruction of the earth or perhaps some unsavory and destructive policies. But if there is no potential problem with climate change, that dilemma is removed and it makes all decisions a lot simpler, moral decisions much simpler because of that and much easier to make the correct moral decision. Okay, I'm a scientist. I've been in climate change biz 60 years. I may not look that old, but it's true. Back when I was a kid in the 1950s, there was a spate of hurricanes in the east coast of the U.S., and I got fascinated by the subject. And at that time, a lot of these hurricanes were attributed to, guess what, humans in the form of nuclear testing in the atmosphere. And somehow, these atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs in the atmosphere were affecting the path and generation of hurricanes. Well, there's been the, new, the Atmospheric Test Ban Treaty a few years later, but guess what? We still have hurricanes. Nothing has changed. And I don't think anybody thinks that these nuclear tests now caused any of those hurricanes. Well, we have a similar issue now, and in the 60 years I've been in climate change, I've seen several changes of climate. In the 1960s, the climate of the east coast of the U.S. shifted to colder and there was bigger snowstorms. And then these ceased later in the 1980s. I've seen several cycles. I've been around long enough to see several cycles in the atmosphere. And we are indeed going through another one. Okay, so for the data, actually, may, does everybody have a copy of this? Showing the ground. Yeah. And I'll definitely go into more detail tomorrow. You know, I got more data, more slides, you know, numerical analyses and all that. But I could say that one says it all. It's an excellent slide. It makes the point that in the past 18 years and how many months? Four months, there's been no global warming. But of course the Earth has been around longer than that. And the truth is, there has been some warming over the past 30 years. So my goal is to determine how much is there, what has caused it, and that is very important because once you pin down what has caused it or what has limited its causes, then you can make a projection into the future and come up with a number. A simple number saying, this is how big the problem is. And is this problem worth dealing with or worth correcting? Okay, so in this graph, again, I'll hold up the chart here. It shows that the bulk of the models have a warming of a bit over one degree, one and a half degrees Celsius, over about a 50 year period. Now this chart does extend into the future. Keep that in mind. Okay. But the real world at the bottom shows a trend of about three-tenths of a degree over 50 years. So the 30 or so years of data you're talking, less than one-fourth of a degree Celsius of overall warming of the atmosphere as measured by satellite, which is the best and only truly global data. And if we're talking about global warming, you need global data. Taking weather stations in Ascension Island and another one in Tahiti and averaging to get, or and a tree in Siberia, to get a global average doesn't quite cut it. That's not a global average. You know, most of the world is not sampled by weather stations. But there are global average temperatures since 1979. So we have this quarter of a degree warming since 1979. The models have projected roughly three times that amount. What can we attribute the warming that has occurred to? And some of the data I'll be able to show tomorrow, I think pretty clearly demonstrates that about half of it is due to events in the 1980s and 1990s, namely two large volcanic eruptions, El Chichon in Mexico and Pinatubo in the Philippines, and especially Pinatubo. And they suppressed the temperatures during 
this 15 year period from say 1980 to 1995 by putting a haze layer in the atmosphere that reduced the amount of sunlight that reached the ground causing a net cooling of a tenth or two tenths of a degree. So if you cool the beginning of the period, the end of the period is relatively warmer, that introduces an upward trend. And my conclusion would be that half of this warming of a quarter of a degree over the past 34 or 35 years is due to the volcanoes early in the period and there haven't been any since 1991, so the earth is heated up a bit because of that. And a bit of the other half is due to carbon dioxide. So the conclusion then would be that carbon dioxide is responsible for one-tenth of one degree of warming over 30 years. So extrapolate that to the end of this century, roughly 90 years, 85 years, that gives you another three-tenths of a degree. And I would call that an upper limit to what's going to happen. Due to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increasing at current rates, and every indication is it is increasing at current rates, not speeding up, not really slowing down, just sort of going on its merry way to 500 parts per million around the year 2100. So, is two tenths of a degree a problem? I don't think so. You'd have a hard time measuring it. You know, go outside with a thermometer and then warm it up two tenths of a degree. You know, really, it's not going to affect your lifestyle, it's not going to affect agricultural productivity, it's not really going to affect anything. So, global warming due to carbon dioxide is a minuscule problem. And I think because of that, people who are forced with a moral dilemma of choosing between this dangerous situation developing and possibly more dangerous policies to combat it, don't really have to worry about that because this dangerous situation is not developed. So it becomes a non-issue. So that's why I think the science is, you know, is important because it can give us a number. Now, of course you have the issue, why does the IPCC stick to these much larger warming trends? Well, they spent billions of dollars to come up with these beautiful models. They're very complex, they're very elegant. A lot of research has gone into them, and very good research where they go out and investigate clouds and investigate circulation patterns in the atmosphere, ocean currents, and volcanoes and interactions with carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. A lot of work has gone into it, but something is wrong, something is missing, and they're having a hard time dealing with that fact. So I will read a couple of quotes from some very interesting scientists over the eons here that relate to this. Okay, one of them has been quoted before, that's Richard Feynman physics professor, where was he, Columbia, I believe? Yeah, yeah. Cal, okay, it was one side of the country. Okay, it doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is, it doesn't matter how smart you are, if it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. And the models are wrong. Well, what to do about that? Well, you can actually learn from being wrong. And here's another quote, it's about Johannes Kepler by Carl Sagan in a very elegant TV episode he did for Cosmos called The Harmony of the Worlds about the life and times of Johannes Kepler, who is a pivotal science, scientist in the history of humanity. So, this is Sagan talking about Kepler. When Johannes Kepler found that his long-cherished beliefs did not agree with the most precise observations, he accepted the uncomfortable facts. He preferred the hard truth to his dearest delusions. That is the heart of science. And so, I think the IPCC would be well behooved to take note of this. That is the heart of science. 
they can learn from this and improve their models and come up with a model that's useful. My, my extrapolation is not really a model, it's a simple fitting a straight line onto the observed data. There's really no great intelligence behind that, but it does tell you that these models are ineffective, you cannot use them. So, I guess I will close with a, you know, quote for myself, which is not, not usually the best part. You know, I think draconian measures to solve this 0.2 degree warming is like using surgery to solve a sniffle. You know, and it's bad on two counts. One, the cure is worse than the ailment. Number two, the cure doesn't even fix the ailment. So, why bother? So, you know, a bumper sticker would be all these draconian policies that could introduce world poverty, especially to the already poor, would be flawed, flawed policies that will fail to solve a non-existent problem. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, and our last speaker here, our, our intent is to, is to address the questions that are going to be addressed at the uh, Pope's Climate Summit tomorrow and to address them as best as we can without seeing it yet. And so tomorrow we're going to have more, uh, more presentations uh, on these issues, but to make sure we didn't miss anything. So far today is uh, Lord Christopher Mogden. He is the Chief Policy Advisor for Science, the Science and Public Policy Institute and a former Special, uh, special Advisor to Margaret Thatcher. Lord Martin. Ego in hoc natus so, et ad hoc veni in hoc mundo, ut testimonium per hibea veritati. That was the Lord of Life himself, and arguably the most well-known courtroom drama in human history. And the words I have just spoken from the Latin Vulgate may even have been very close to the words he himself spoke, and he may have spoken those words to the governor of Judea in Latin. And what he was saying is this, unto this was I born, for this cause came I into this world, that I might bear witness to the truth. And the main reason, Your Holiness, why we are here today is that it is not the business of the Church to stray from the field of faith and morals and wander into the playground that is science. If you do so, then you should do so as your predecessors did and you should listen to both sides of the scientific argument and not make the mistake that you made in April of last year at the joint session of the Pontifical Academies of Social Science and of Science of inviting only people of one narrow, poisonous, political and scientific viewpoint which has been repeatedly discredited as events and the science and the data have unfolded. It is not the business of the church to pronounce on science. When seven of the ten cardinals who sat in judgment over Galileo Galilei came to an accommodation with him by which he agreed not to draw theological conclusions from the fact that the earth goes round the sun rather than vice versa, provided he would accept uh, and make a declaration that the earth doesn't go round the sun. That decision to enter into the realm of science resonates and does harm to Holy Mother Church to this day. When the Church decided to set fire to and kill Giordano Bruno because he said there might be life on other worlds, once again the Church strayed beyond its competence, beyond the realm for which its founder established it. 
and in doing so not only committed murder, but also got egg on its face all down the generations. So your holiness, do not do this again. As you have heard from the moving testimony of Cal Beisner today, whom you could not have told on listening to him that he was not a Catholic theologian, but he is a formidable theologian. As you have heard from him, the first people who will get hurt if you continue to listen to the Secretary General of the United Nations and to Mr. Sachs and the various other undesirables to whom you have been listening, the first people to get hurt will be those whom you least wish to hurt, the poor. It is they who suffer first and worst by the non-availability of cheap, affordable electricity which coal-fired and gas-fired power can give. It is a scandal that outside South Africa virtually nobody anywhere in Africa has any electricity. It's a scandal that in many parts of China, particularly in Western China, there's no electricity. In many parts of India, no electricity. Electricity is actually good for the environment. It's also good for the poor. There is no faster way to lift the poor out of poverty than fossil fuel electricity. And the modern coal-fired and gas-fired power stations are remarkably clean. They do not cause the damage and death that they used to cause through pollution. So there is where you should concentrate your effort. Encourage the spread of fossil fuel electricity throughout those parts of the world that do not have it now. For if you wish to stabilize the world's population and thereby reduce the overall environmental footprint of humankind, the fastest, surest way to that is to lift the people out of poverty. And the fastest, surest way to do that is with fossil fuel electricity. That is the best and safest way to do it. Now, of course, it doesn't very much matter to the rest of the world what view the church takes now on this. Very nearly all governments have long since made up their minds on this question. And some me too scientific statement from somebody who is not a physicist but a chemist, is unlikely to carry very much weight in the councils of the world. The damage that would be done by a statement that strays into the science on this question, on either side, will be to the church herself. For yet again, she will have gone beyond what she was founded to do and would be in danger, certainly, if the Pope takes the side he has indicated he is going to take at the moment, it will have yet again got the science 100% plumb wrong. Therefore, Your Holiness, be cautious. Your office enjoins it upon you. On any view, it is not possible to ascribe to global warming the extreme weather events that have occurred because for the last 18 years and 4 months on this record, the last 17 years on the UAE's record, there hasn't been any global warming, and that which has not occurred cannot have caused that which has. Also, extreme weather events are reducing in number in recent years, we don't know why, but what is clear is that deaths from extreme weather are at an all-time low at present. Therefore, for all these reasons, and for the economic reason that if you proceed on the course which you have so far indicated you will proceed along, you will be kicking the poor in the teeth. Stand back, listen to both sides, and do not take sides in politics, for you not only demean yourself in so doing, but you demean the office that you hold, and you demean the church whom it is your sworn duty to protect and defend, defend and advance. God bless you, your holiness. We pray that wiser counsels than those to whom you have been listening may yet prevail and you will stand back from intervening on either side 
in the climate debate, and remember that the first duty of the church is to the poorest in the world, and they need electricity, and they need it now. God bless you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Martin. I would like to invite our speakers uh, to come up. That is the uh, the end of the program. Of course, everyone here um, is happy to stand uh, for questions that uh, are from the audience. Um, I just wanted to, to remind you, a lot of the science that they talked about today, uh, we had shipped, we had sent, and hoped to ship to us to this room today, copies of Climate Change Reconsidered, the, the Climate Change Reconsidered series from the Heartland Institute. Some people, some people in this room have seen it before. It is four volumes, about that tall and about 20 pounds, and uh, it's an impressive set of documents. Unfortunately, uh, we weren't able to get it here in time. But I also want to thank our speakers who, uh, on very short notice, have come from very far away uh, to Rome uh, this week. And so I want to thank them and have, uh, open this up uh, to any questions. Thank you. Oh, sorry, can you, when you have any asked a question, can you please identify yourself? Thank you. Phil from Lawyers. Um, I think one of the problems we're facing here is that we, the colleagues that I know in the world here, we're, we're not science reporters, and I don't have trouble with the water. So the question is not whether my question is whether not, I'm not taking any position on the one to change for camera at this point. But I'd like to talk to you about the religious aspects. And so my first question is for Mark Ryan. And you said that the uh, the, the Vatican's position is, quote, not in step with Catholics around the world. Um, and I'd like to know how you came to that conclusion. Did you do a survey? I, 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 did you do, how can you say something like that? Did you do a survey on Catholics on what they think about climate change? You said it's not in step with Catholics around the world. You then went on to say that Catholics have, uh, are, uh, as far as doctrine is concerned, pick and choose. Um, and we know very well that there's one country in the world where the um, uh, Catholics are almost universally disregarded. Um, the ban on official birth control is the United States yes. and Western Europe. That's right. And they pick and choose. So if they effectively disobey a papal encyclical on a very personal issue like birth control, the United States is very well low birth rate, and it's not just the sad that impose that as the United States. <laughs> um, why would they be, why is this a moral dilemma? And why are they so excited about this, in a sense of why is there a moral dilemma that they already made their choices about, and you use the word pick and choose? Then later on, um, Professor Dory said, many Catholics on our research team disagree with, you know, the, the model. How big is your research team, Dr. Thor, and what yep. percentage of those are capital? I've got about 37 people who ask to be on distribution for our discussions. I'd say more than 20 are retired NASA scientists and engineers who were like veterans like me of the Apollo program. But do you feel comfortable, I'll well, get back to you because you haven't answered yet, do you feel comfortable with that as a NASA scientist going along about models and representation and stuff about science? But are you sure that those 36 people are representative of scientists all over the world? Or just well, I'm just saying here, we have some credibility. We are the guys who put men on the moon and brought them back. We use the same approaches that NASA taught us how to use to do that job. And we have concluded there is not a global warming problem from fossil fuels. That's our that's our decision. It's not NASA's decision. NASA still gets a lot of money to go prove that CO2 is a problem. We disagree with the current NASA scientists. But if you want to know what some old grandparent Apollo engineers think, you can go to our website, therightclimatestuff.com. I don't have any problem with the science because you're actually much technical by that. Well, I, I'm not understanding the thrust of the question. I'm just saying, I'm here because I'm concerned that my Holy Father may make an embarrassing mistake for the church. I pray for his discernment. I, like other speakers have said, especially Lord Hunter, 
please listen to all views, not just the ones that you're getting from the United Nations. Mark, you want to address the question? Yeah, uh, just give me the questions in one second. Give me the second question first again, and then I'll do the first one. I think you misinterpreted me on the first one. But the second one was what again? Second, second question to me. Second one was connected to identity. You had a two part for me, though. I'm just well, trying to remember what you guys Essentially, it's a, 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 it's oh. a, you said. A la carte. You said, you said that this is that the, the, the fears on climate change, global warming, et cetera, quote, not accepted Catholics around the world. Did you take a survey? Oh, no, I, 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 I didn't say that the, the fears were not. I'm saying the, the actual solutions of the UN Treaty are not in step with Catholics. I, there was no survey taken of Catholics. But I was saying in the a la carte, the, the, the gist of what I'm saying is Catholics are already in the United States. They're having a problem because they, choose, they can choose which doctrine they follow. If somehow climate science now is elevated to some, not, it won't be officially a doctrine, but it won't be officially an article of faith, but in the minds of the public, they're going to be hearing a pope, and if they disagree with him, it's just another thing for the public to say, well, well I don't agree with the church on that either. It's making a non sort of faith and morals uh, issue rise to that level. So that's what I meant by that. But no, I, I'm not, there, are, there actually probably are surveys on Catholic belief, but I don't think they'd be much deviant from the rest of the population on that. By the way, the US population, according to Gallup every year, the general population, ranks global warming not just dead last among all issues, including terrorism, economics, uh, foreign policy, but dead last among environmental issues. It's actually seven out of seven behind species extinction, deforestation, and air and water quality. It's, it's stunning how low it is as a priority, according to Gallup, which has been doing this. And there's actually the lowest level since 1989, this past year, 2015. So the public in general, which includes many Catholics, is not clamoring for climate action. More questions? Ma'am? Uh, yes, indeed. Perhaps I may answer the question. Yes, ma'am, it's always a delight to have somebody from the New York Times here. Um, ben, ben the I have had discussions with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences on this question and discovered that this was uh, discovered that they are taking a line which I think they may come to regret. And I have indicated to them that caution would be sensible in the circumstances and that we don't want to make the same kind of mistake as the church has made in the past when straying into areas that are really not her field. Um, I have also had contacts with the Commission of Cardinals and had discussions at that level as well. Uh, where there is, I think, an appropriate feeling that this one does have to be handled with kid gloves. It is something that requires great care and thought. The Pope himself, with whom I have not had conversations on this issue, is in general thought to be minded to do what he says he is intending to do and take quite a strong line on the climate question. And his motive in doing so is one of concern. He is genuinely concerned that there may be a problem here and unfortunately he has not really been exposed yet to any serious argument from those of us who have contributed to the science on this question and who take a view other than that which those who he has consulted are taking. And there is a concern that there should be and needs to be balance in that sense before anything further is proceeded. And what I am reasonably hopeful of as a result of those discussions, and you'll forgive me if I don't name names because the way these things work, one doesn't name names, uh, is that the encyclical will be a very powerful encyclical on the wider question of the environment. It cannot avoid 
mentioning climate change, which will not, however, be the dominant theme of the encyclical. And there will be at least something in it of the caution on the question of attribution that is evident in a growing sense in the scientific literature. And a, a caution also on the balance between taking action on the climate in a manner which may prove disproportionately expensive and may in particular lead to very substantial transfers of wealth from the poor to the rich. And the effect on the poor of taking measures which may prove inappropriate but which will unquestionably make the poor poorer and the rich richer is something which weighs very heavily on the Holy See's mind and even on the Pope's mind. And just to take an example from the United Kingdom, uh, two years ago we had snow covering the entire British, not the entire British Isles, but the entire Great Britain, England and Scotland and Wales entirely under snow for the first time in many decades, I think. And it was a very cold December when this happened the whole month of the snow on the ground, and over and above the usual number of excess deaths that occur in the winter, there were 7,000 additional excess deaths. Now those excess deaths were not co caused because the weather was cold, but because the homes of the people who died were cold, because of the very large increases in the price of electricity and heating oil which have chiefly arisen, not because the underlying materials are expensive, but because there are heavy loadings on the cost to pay for climate change and to pay for unreliable and environmentally damaging windmills and so forth. And this is a circumstance of which the Pope is now aware that there are real dangers in rushing into policy decisions which could start killing people now because they can't afford to heat or cool, whichever direction it is, their home. So I think we're going to get, in fact, a more balanced encyclical than that which the one end of the press has perhaps hoped. And I pray that that will be the case, and that is why we're here. Very good, thank you, Chris. Can you do that first off? Environment and Public Works Committee authored a report of over 400 dissenting scientists uh, from around the world who dissented on this so-called consensus. Then we went to 650, then 750, and then eventually we exceeded 1,000 and stopped collecting names. That was the final report. Um, when you hear things like 97%, in one instance, the 97% consensus isn't even 97 scientists. It actually was only 77 scientists who they whittled down from 10,000 and had these questions that most skeptics would agree with. The UN uh, governments pick scientists to go to the United Nations and then usually they're only scientists who play ball with the, with, with the agenda of the United Nations and what the governments want. So the UN is not a good representation. You look at things like the World Geological uh, Forum in 2000, one was about six years ago, two thirds of the presenters were skeptical. You looked at surveys of the American Meteorological Society, even though the governing boards of National Academy of Science, American Meteorological, they'll come out with two dozen governing board members and come out with a statement basically in line with the United Nations that man is causing global warming and that it's a big, big concern. But yet the rank and file members don't agree. In the case of the American Meteorological Society, there have been surveys that showed up to 75% or around 50% at the very least don't agree with these two dozen governing board members. Um, it's scientists around the world. These are self-selected climatologists. If you talk to geologists and get out of the realm of the, the specialists in climatology, meaning the self-selected ones who participate in the UN or who get into the government grant process, scientists from around the world are massively descending and there really is no way to quantify a number to that 
But you know, people like Richard Toll have looked at the UN lead author, Dr. Richard Toll, has looked at the claims of 97% consensus. He testified to our Congress in 2014 that it was quote plucked from thin air. The number it's total nonsense. Uh, it's hard, it, 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 but I can't give you an alternative number because I don't want to make one up. But I will say this: that the surveys of rank and file showed anywhere from 50%, 75% of dissenting rank and file scientists when you get outside of the governing boards of these big groups, or you get outside of the United Nations. Quickly, Cal. No. Add? I just might add quickly. Uh, I have taught logic on the graduate level, and uh, it used to be that most people learned logic as they went through school. Unfortunately, that doesn't tend to be the case anymore. But they're back to the time of Aristotle. Aristotle pointed out that argumentum uh, ad popum is a fallacy. Counting noise and noses, or noises, really doesn't matter. Einstein, to go to the scientist rather than the logician, pointed out that it only takes one fact to prove any theory false. No number of facts can prove a theory true, but one fact contrary to the theory proves it false. Einstein also pointed out it only takes one scientist to come up with that one fact to prove any theory false. So frankly, counting noses really isn't the issue. Looking at the data is the issue. As Hal Gorin quoted from NASA, in God we trust, all others bring data. Adam, I think I can help you with this, and I can figure on it because I'm the co-author of a peer-reviewed paper on this question of consensus, Lee Gates et al. 2013 is the reference. We reviewed the paper claiming 97.1% consensus uh, that most of the warming since 1950 was caused by us. And to put that in context, uh, that means no more than that something like a third of a Celsius degree or more of warming has happened since 1950 because of us. But when I reviewed the data file by the authors of that paper, which I obtained from them only three weeks after they published it, it wasn't even available to their peer reviewers, I discovered that they themselves had marked only 64 papers, or 0.5% of the 11,944 papers that they reviewed over the past 21 years for this process, as taking the UN's consensus so-called view. When I read those 64 papers, I found that only 41 of them, that's 0.3% of the entire sample, endorsed the notion that one third of a Celsius or more of global warming since 1950 was caused by us. Significantly, the question whether that sort of warming would be dangerous wasn't even asked, because the consensus on that would probably have been even smaller. Those are the figures. I refer you to that paper. There is no consensus on what we are being told there is a consensus on, and the paper you will find published in Education and Science in August 2013. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. And I would also add that, um, again, we didn't get it shipped here in time, but the Climate Change Reconsidered series, which you can get at climatechangereconsidered.org, it's compiled about 4,000 pages of examination of the peer-reviewed literature that makes the case that humans are not causing a climate crisis and in fact on the whole maybe even CO2 increase in human CO2 emissions will be a net benefit to humanity and uh, animals and plant life of course. Another question? You are? Senator Inhofe from the EPW, we had, had extensive contact with Cardinal Pell of Australia, his staff at the time, and he's now the head of the bank, he's not in the typical Academy of Science, but I have, we've had contact with senior Vatican officials, but not, I haven't had it recently. So that's previously? Previously, yes. I mean, any connection to these? Is anyone else? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, not with respect to environment, but in 2013, I was an observer of the first Human Trafficking Conference at the uh, Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. Um, also, I might add that at that conference, Jeffrey Sachs was invited. Um, he did not attend. He did attend the 
uh, the next human trafficking conference and then the two previous environmental conferences. So that's been my contact with respect to the Vatican in this issue. Can you follow up on that? You mentioned that you have uh, spoken to the and that based on that The Holy See was the first nation on earth to maintain permanent diplomatic representatives to other nations around the world. It has extremely good antennae for detecting trouble in the making. There is um, plenty of, sorry? Oh, the, Holy See. the Holy See, sorry, the, the back of the Holy See, um, has very good antennae. It's, it's well aware that this is a subject on which one particular, actually quite narrow political faction, has taken a very, very strong but increasingly unscientific view. Uh, there is some consciousness among some of the cardinals who have studied this question, not all of them have, that uh, the science is more divided than perhaps, shall we say, the Guardian is willing to reflect. I, perhaps you correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember the Guardian ever having revealed quite how long there has not been any global warming of the atmosphere, nor revealing how in the oceans, for instance, the rate of global warming in the oceans since the last 11 years, which, which we have reasonable data from the Argo Battle Thermograph, is equivalent to 0.2 Celsius per century. Uh, now, these kind of facts, uh, it's been difficult to get them across, but attempts have been and continue to be made to make sure that both sides of the facts are presented and I now have some reasonable confidence that uh, a sensibly nuanced encyclical will result. And the Holland Institute, we started putting this, this trip together, frankly, uh, four or five days ago. And so uh, we have, uh, through friends and emissaries, made outreach to the Vatican um, to get in and speak to some cardinals, and even, uh, if we can, participate or at least observe the summit that's going on tomorrow. We, we made a follow-up on query on that today, and so we hope and frankly expect to have some subset of this contingent uh, observing that tomorrow. Well, sorry. Um, For, uh, you know, yes. Yeah, you know, I was wondering if you guys knew that this is what was currently already done, and if you had been doing it possibly if maybe making this summit. Oh, when you could actually influence what the process has already written. Right. Well, I mean, this summit itself, I think, you only announced on the 14th or 15th of April, so it was kind of a, it was a quick event to do yeah. this. I'll let maybe someone else speak to when the encyclical was written, maybe count. Or having it completely finished and, and not worthy of a response, I would argue that it's never too late. There's nothing fine yeah. necessarily. Um, the latest I read is that uh, the draft of the encyclical is in Cardinal Mueller's office and he is reviewing it at the CDF. Um, that's, that's the latest I know. In fact, um, it was just two weeks ago that they posted this upcoming um, conference with the link between human trafficking and the environment. So that's, it's, you know, a breaking story at this point. Yeah, I, the, the way they've always handled this, even with Pope John Paul II and then Pope Benedict, They've been very, very cautious in all their wording. In fact, you can get Pope Benedict and actually find quotes where he sounds like a climate skeptic. And then there are many quotes where he sounds very similar to Pope Francis today, where he's endorsing sort of solutions and he's concerned about global warming. So that's how they've always straddled it in the past. I don't believe the document's finished, and I think it's gonna, it's gonna end up being finessed at some point before it goes public. And what I mean by that is, just like the IPCC juices their reports to promote the alarm, uh, the Vatican may end up downgrading this to sort of set to quiet some of the controversy. They're going to have to because I don't, I can't imagine Pope Francis wants a distraction 
Why does he, uh, you know, a few years into his papacy, want to start dealing with a, a major contentious United Nations climate treaty that's going to be steeped in politics with John Kerry and President Obama and world leaders when it, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense? So I believe this encyclical will probably be, be, be uh, dialed back. Uh, and I think if you look at the past things, it's almost like if you want to see a pope as a skeptic with Pope Benedict, you can. If you want to hear words that sound very similar to a climate global warming promoter, you can find that as well. And I think the Vatican will probably stay to some ground. They'll probably put in some kind of disclaimer, is what I would guess. Why do you expect that? I'm going to follow up on what you just said. Why would you expect him or the acceptable to be, uh, you said that you do not, why would he to take a stand on such a contentious issue? Like, in only two years, he has used the word genocide with the U.S. That's uh, when they, when they, uh, the Armenian genocide with the U.S. Yes. administration refuses to use it because they've got a basis in Turkey. Uh, he has uh, talked about unrivaled capitalism, etc. Et He's done all kinds of things that people say, don't go there. Sure. He's done it anyway. So why is it that? Well, a lot of the stuff you're referring to, too, have been sort of off-the-cuff comments, his famous airplane uh, press conferences. If he, I don't, what I'm referring to specifically is an encyclical. I don't think they will. And actually, it's probably for the same reason Republican presidents usually end up being terrible when it comes to global warming, in terms of standing up to global warming. The most liberal member of any Republican president's, uh, presidency is usually the EPA administrator. In fact, all the former Republican EPA administrators endorse Obama's EPA climate regulations. And what I, the analogy I'm making is the Pope is not going to want to deal with this distraction in a formal encyclical. I can't imagine an off-the-cuff comment, a speech somewhere on an airplane, a press conference. That's different than actually making it permanent. Ultimately, they're going to decide it's probably not important enough to be a distraction. The same way Republican presidents decide, well, we're going to accept the UN reports, we're going to accept the IPCC, as George W. Bush did, as George W. Bush did, as, as the first George Bush did, George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, and it, it, and I think. Ultimately, they'll decide it's not worth it because uh, they're, they're, they're going to see it as a, a huge can of worms. Uh, it's a potato that, again, we're talking about the politics. It's not, people aren't that as concerned about his view on climate science as it, the fact that he appears to be setting an unprecedented role as a lobbying for a specific UN climate treaty. That is what separates him from previous popes if that goes ahead and happens. Carol, you had your hand up before. Do you have any? It was the same question. Oh, <laughs> yeah. great. That's efficient. Appreciate it. Uh, any questions for anyone else? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to again remind you uh, we'll be around here uh, today and through uh, tomorrow at the tomorrow. There's a, there's another there's another program with PowerPoint slides where these uh, these scientists and, and experts can get into more detail at the plots of Cardinal Sessi right next door down the street here at 1 p.m. tomorrow, and we're also serving lunch, so if you're hungry, you can also get that done as well. Yeah, I can entice you for a second day, you know, food will do it. Be that or be square. I would invite you, if you've not already picked one up, to pick up a copy of our open letter to Pope Francis on climate change that the Cornwall Alliance put together. Uh, that is on its way to him, whether it actually reaches him personally, of course, is a matter of the internal politics of the sea. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here, and, uh, and we'll see you around. Thank you.